Spirit of God, give us a deep hunger for more of you. Lord, help us break through any lethargicness, if that's even a word. I pray that you just help us to just see Jesus somehow tonight, Lord, in a fresh way. We give you tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, we're in chapter 18. Um, if you've been tracking with us through the Leviticus study, um, last week I mentioned that we started actually the, the second and last major division of the book. And so this book whose major theme is the holiness of God, and we've talked a lot about the setting and all of that. I won't take the time tonight. But the first 16 chapters dealt with this idea of sacrifice, that you don't just get to come and approach God any way you want, that there's got to be an offering because God is holy and we are not and we need to be, have our sins covered to come into his presence. But when you get to chapter 17, it kind of turns a little bit and it goes from the idea of sacrifice to the idea of separation. And by separation, what I mean by that is that it's talking about how you live and how God's people were to live. And, and very simply, God said, I'm holy and you're to be holy. And kind of the, the idea of holiness, whether you say sanctification, holy, holiness, separation, it's kind of all the same idea. It means to be set apart. And so as God's people, he's teaching them, hey, you need to be set apart from the world and to God. And guys, that's an important concept that I'll repeat over and over again, because oftentimes when you talk about holy living, we can make the mistake of saying, we just need to stop doing those bad things. But the idea is not just stop doing bad things. There's the negative side where you pull away from sin, but there's the positive side where you press into Jesus, amen? And if you don't have that second part, you'll never actually be able to live a holy life because it'll just be trying to say no to sin instead of just saying yes to Jesus, and the key to victory is more Jesus. Amen? So that's something that we'll talk about more. But for now, the idea is separation. And, and we're going to talk about a lot of different things. It gets pretty personal, as we've already seen, and as we'll see again tonight. Um, last week, chapter 17, was dealing with this issue of blood. It's bigger than just blood, but it was, it was dealing with the sanctity of life and, and things that are important and how... God's people were to look at those things and treat those things, and so he dealt with that. As we get to chapter 18, now he's going to be instructing them in areas of sexual relationships. This whole chapter is basically about sex. I told my wife, I'm like, hey, on Instagram, just put um, sex ed tonight at church or something like that. I don't think she did that, but she just looked at me like, you're an idiot. I'm not going to do that. Um, but th this is, it is. It's like God has something to say. Uh, about sex. And I was thinking about this too because, um, you know, on, on Sunday, Pastor Steve taught on 1 Corinthians 16 dealing with money. And he made that, he said something to the effect of, you know, oftentimes that's one of the last areas of our life that we surrender to God. And tonight I'm talking about sex. And I can't help but think that the Holy Spirit is saying something to Calvary Chapel North Shore that there's to be no area of our life that's not fully submitted to him. Amen? That God wants every bit of your life. And we make the mistake of living our lives oftentimes like the old school TV dinners, if you're old enough to even remember those, where you have the TV dinners and they have like the segmented trays, which is a great idea. Food shouldn't touch, clearly. But, you know, and, and there's like the meat-like substance and then there's like the vegetables and then the lava potatoes and you know, and you pull it out of the oven or the microwave, and it's like, that's how we want to live our lives sometimes. We'll give the main portion to you, God, but I've got this little section over here of dessert. That's mine, and I'll compartmentalize. Listen, God wants to take that, flip it over, and mix it all, all together in a sense and say, every area of your life is to be separated to me. Amen? And the longer I walk with Christ, the more I find those little pockets of resistance that I have to resubmit to God, and I really feel like God's got a word for us tonight in this area of sex. It's, it's a pretty, would you say this is a pretty um, relevant topic, anyone? Guys, every single one of us at some level will be dealing with this or have dealing with or currently dealing with it, and um, God has a lot to say about sex. I'll just say a couple words on sex before we actually get into it, and that is, you know, it's good for us to remember that God thought it up. Like, God is not a prude. God 
thought up the whole connection, the whole thing. And God's desire is to bless us, to have this wonderful union. Sex was designed to be between a man and a woman within the covenant of marriage and only within the covenant of marriage. And it was to be this expression, is to be this expression fully like physical, emotional, spiritual. You know, the world just doesn't understand. They, they mock God's ideas of sex. But, but the world's idea, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, they, they had this idea of, well, hey, food for the body, body for food. In other words, they were saying sex is just another physical appetite that you know, when you're hungry, you eat. When you want to have sex, you have sex. You pound it out. You deal with that appetite. And... You know, it's kind of left at that very base level. God takes the sexual relationship and elevates it to something that's sacred and wonderful and deeper and better than anything that the world could counterfeit. So God, you know, I read this one. I don't know if I, this is a good analogy, I guess, but, you know, somebody wants likened sex to a raging river that's rushing between two banks on each side. And as long as the river stays within those banks, that river brings life, and joy and goodness. But if the river's out of control and overflowing its banks and raging and breaks the banks down, what does it cause? Chaos, destruction, and pain. We know all about that when we're living in Hanalei in 2018, right? And the Hanalei River just, just, and just wiping houses out. And guys, I know that analogy breaks down. But what you, when you look at God's desire for the sexual relationship and you see the world and it's raging and out of control, we, we're seeing... Just you see the, the hurt, the pain, the emotional pain, the psychological pain, the physical pain, rape, molestation, you know, human trafficking, divorce, broken families, anguish, on and on and on. I was talking to a young married couple today, and the girl says, you know, we waited to have sex till we got married, speaking of her husband. And she goes, and we still deal with feelings of insecurities and our bodies and, you know, just like in the world telling you to look a certain way and they're still dealing like that. And she's like, and we waited till we got married and we still deal with those things. She's like, I can't even imagine if my husband would have had multiple partners or if I would have, the, the stuff that would have been dragged into that. Now, I'm not saying there's not forgiveness and God can do healing, of course, and we'll touch on all that. But the point is, is like there's, when, when, when overflowing its banks, it causes destruction. So God knows what he's talking about. And so, relevant, good things. And I think that God tonight wants to encourage us, wants to maybe correct some of us, challenge some of us, but let's get into it. Before he actually gets into the topic itself, in verses one through five, he lays down a really important foundation, so much so that I would say if we just skip the rest of the chapter and the details and just looked at verses one through five, we would still come away with the main idea. He's giving some foundations for obedience. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to take notes. If you're a note taker, I am. Helps me to remember. Two basic principles that are in verses one through five. Let me read verses one through four to get the first one. It says this. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I'm bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord, your God. So right off the rip here, God says, look, um, I want you to live differently than the rest of the world. You are my people. And he says, I don't want you to live your life or do or practice life or walk in the way that the Egyptians lived, where you came from. Remember, they had just come out of their people, 400 plus years of Egyptian influence. And he says, I know that's been your, your, your benchmark, what you've seen. I don't want you to live like that anymore. And I don't want you to live like where you're going, future tense. See, they were in the desert right now, but they're on their way to the land of promise, Canaan. And he's like, look, I don't want you to live like the Egyptians. I don't want you to live like the Canaanites because I want you to live according to my ways. And just real quickly, here's, the, here's the, what God is saying. Real simply, God's people are to live differently than the world. Egypt is a type of the world, and, and, and the Canaanites are a type of our flesh. 
And, and guys, what was true of them is true of, of us as God's people. Now, if you're not one of God's people, if you're not a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, no one's expecting you to live any different. But if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, we are a separated people. We're to be separated from the world and separated to God, and our lives are to be lived differently than spiritual Egypt, if you would. The world, the system around us has a way of thinking and a way of doing life. And as God's people, that's not where we take our cues from. We're to take our cues from God's word, amen? Doesn't matter where you came from or where you're currently living. What's important is that we live separated lives under God. Real quick, I was thinking about that. You know, in Ephesians 2, verse 2, it says this. Oh, verse 1, he says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins and whence you, with which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. You know, before you got saved, you had no choice but to just live like the world. You were its robot. And, but now that you're saved, the Spirit of God lives in you, and you're able to live differently. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I love this part where he says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Speaking to believers, he says, don't be deceived, neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, or adulterers, or men who practice homosexuality, or thieves, or greedy, or drunks, or it goes on and on and on. He goes, and such were some of you. But he says, but you've been washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Such were some of you. Such were some of me. That's who we were then. But because Christ has come into our life, we are new creations. Amen? So again, let me speed this up a little bit. The point is, he's saying, as my people, I want you to live differently. You're gonna, your life's going to look different in every area, including sex. Now, here's the first principle, though. The principle for obedience that I see in verses 1 through 4 is this, that our obedience is based on two things, who he is and who we are in relation to him. Look at what he says, and he bookends it, verse 1 and verse 4. He says the same thing. He says, uh, actually, verse 2 and verse 4, he says, say to them, I am the Lord, your God. At the end of verse 4, I am the Lord, your God. He'll say it again in verse 5, I am the Lord. Why should I live differently? Why should I obey God? Here's the first reason. I'm the Lord, God says. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your Bible, which is a reference to his name, Yahweh, which is a throwback to Exodus 3, when Moses was face-to-face with this burning bush and God revealed himself and called him to go to Egypt. You guys remember this? And he says, well, who shall I say sent? What's your name? And he says, I am that I am. Every time you read the word Lord in all caps in your Bible, it's a reference to Jehovah, I am, Yahweh, his name. And it speaks of who he is. In essence, God is saying, I want you to obey because I'm the Lord, almighty. I created you. I'm all powerful, all knowing. You know what? Had he stopped right there, that's enough reason for us to obey him. Amen? Amen. He's God. He doesn't owe us any explanations. We're not entitled to any more information than that. We're just lucky he reveals himself to us at all. He says, I'm the Lord. That's why you obey me. I sometimes think that, especially us in the Western church, we forget the fear of God sometimes. That he's God. Well, I feel this way. Who cares how you feel? Happiness is not... God, or at least it shouldn't be, God is God. And there's a certain level at which I I think we need to recapture this, where we say, you know what? God just said so, and I don't need a bunch of explanation. Amen? He's so gracious, though. What's he do? He gives us explanations. He gives us more information. He says this, live differently because I'm the Lord, but then what does he say? Your God. You see, that personal pronoun thrown in there changes everything. I'm the Lord but I'm your God. Speaking to Israel in this context, that word your is is talking about the covenant relationship that they have with God. God has just redeemed them out of Egypt by the blood of a lamb, brought them through the Red Sea, made them a nation. They are his peculiar people. And he's saying, you're gonna obey me because A, I'm God, and B, I'm your God. We have a relationship. I've been brought you into a covenant relationship. Can I say this? Man, That is a good principle for obedience. Why? Because God said so, but God is my God. 
who redeemed me by the blood of Jesus Christ and bought my soul out of hell. And I don't have to obey God. I get to obey God. He has demonstrated his love for me. There's the basis and the principle, number one, that God calls on for their obedience. And then secondly, look at verse 5. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, please don't miss this. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. The New Living Translation um, has that as, um, let me see if I can find it. If you obey my regulations, you will find life through them. Basically, the second principle, I put it this way, obedience equals life. I think the biggest lie, or at least one of them, of Satan is that God is holding out on us. I think you can trace that back to Genesis chapter 3. Hath God said you shall not eat of all the fruit? Oh, no, no, he said we could, but you know, we'll die if we eat this one. Oh, that's because if you eat that one, you'll have the knowledge of of good and evil. And we opted for knowledge instead of obedience. And the trick was, oh, God's holding out on you. God's put these regulations because he, he's just hemming you in and restrictive. And that is such a lie from Satan. And, and I can't think of any other area in life where it's more used by him than in this area of sexual relationships. Because the world will say, that God is so regulatory, so like confining, so hemming you in. Oh, he's keeping you. Only a man and a woman, only in marriage. Oh, that's so confining. It's such a lie by Satan. God is actually saying, I want the absolute best for you, and I want you to actually enjoy sex the way it could actually be experienced the most intensely, and that is in this way only. But you can take that to every other topic. Guys, when you obey God, when I walk in his ways, they are life. What what did Jesus say? John 10, 10. The thief, that is Satan, came to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life, and life what? More abundantly. I wish we actually believed that. What if we actually believed that Jesus wants you to have life and life abundantly? Not just eternal life someday when you die, but right now to experience life the way it was meant to be lived, and it's through Jesus, it's through submitting your life to him, following his ways. That's where life is found. Amen? So I like to throw that in. I think it's important that you put this here because God's not saying, obey my rules and suffer. He's saying, obey my rules and be stoked. You're going you're gonna to be so much better off. You're going to live. Now, having said all of that, let's get into this. Oh, let me actually throw this in here for those of you who are maybe thinking this through, that phraseology where it says, do them or live by, you. if you do them, you'll live. You know, even if you agree with that, if you obey all of God's rules, that's life. You know what you're going to find out at some point? You can't. I mean, it's true, but the reality is none of us can actually keep all of his rules. We need his grace. I'm not kind of calling any hands on this sermon, but I'd, I'd venture to say that the vast majority, uh, 99.99% of us, have failed in some way in sexual sin. None of us are able to keep the rules and do it right 100% of the time. But thank God for the grace of Jesus Christ, who not only forgives us, then puts his spirit in us, enabling us to walk in new life. Amen. Well, those are the principles. Just to sum up real quick. Um, obedience based on who God is and our relationship to him. And then secondly, obedience based on the fact that it brings life. God's not saying obey to be miserable. He's saying obey to be, just enjoy life the way it was meant to be. Now we get into the nitty-gritty. And uh, I'm going to fly through some of these pretty darn quick, and you'll see why. So um, in verses 6 through 18, he's basically dealing with painstakingly, um, this idea of incest. So I'll talk more about that in a second, but look at verse 6. He says, None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. Now, real quickly, I want to deal with this phrase, uncover their nakedness. Whatever translation you're reading from, save the NIV. I think the NIV says sexual relationship, something like that. That captures the idea. 
But this phrase is used 17 times. Don't uncover their nakedness. Don't uncover his nakedness or her nakedness. But the idea behind that, just to be clear, is not so much looking upon the nakedness. It actually is speaking more of sexual activity, which would include touching, molestation, anything, and sexual intercourse. And so um, that's what that's referring to. Let's keep moving. So prohibition against incest. Verse 7, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother, belongs to her. Um, she is your member, or excuse me, your mother. Uh, you shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. Verse 9, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, for their nakedness is your own nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, brought up in your father's family, since she is your sister. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. She is your father's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is your mother's relative. Verse 14, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. That is, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, of her daughter, and of her daughter, excuse me. And you shall not take her son's daughter or, or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. They are relatives. It is depravity. Right there, that word depravity means it's wicked. It's not acceptable to God. Verse 18. You shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. So you're thinking, perhaps, really? Couldn't we have just summed that up with like one sentence? <laughs> Did we really need to break down every possible scenario? And the answer to that is yes. There is a reason why you have to break down every possible scenario. Why? Because in our humanness, we are capable of anything. And they're in there for a reason because it was happening. You know, to us, and I'll say this, because the moment you say incest or start talking about the nakedness of your mothers, you know, you're like, oh, you're just like, you don't even want to talk about it. Trust me, this is not one of those where I'm like, sweet, chapter 18. Um, but to our ears, you know, as Americans, we're like, that is just foul. It's like, oh, just get past this. Move on as quickly as you can. I don't even want to talk about it. It's taboo. It's, I mean, who, obvious. This is so obvious to us in our culture. But guys, you need to understand something. This is not so obvious to every culture. Nor has it that, been that long where this wasn't a practice. I mean, you can go on and line and read about famous kings and people that, were, that were, had major defects because of inbreeding and all that stuff. This is something that still happens. It happens in molestation. It happens in just other cultures where it's actually more accepted. Here's what I'm going to say. To our cultural ears, we say, oh, gross, taboo. But to other culture, ear, cultural ears, they're like, oh, really? We, should, we can't do that? Why? Because maybe it's accepted in their culture. And it was very normative in the Canaanite culture to which they were headed. Here's my point. Culture cannot dictate our morality because cultures come and go and cultures change like the wind. And we might say now sitting here, this is so grotesque, but there may be something else that we land upon and go, really, that's not that bad. We cannot allow culture to shape as God's people where we get our morals and what we say is right and what we say is wrong. God's word gets to be that final word. Amen? It's easy to say amen to this one. But the sad reality is, is that the culture has infected the church in the West, my life and your life, so badly to where other sins that are clearly sins, we look at it and say, well, everybody does that. It's not that big of a deal. And we have to fight that. We have to really fight that. And say, no, we need to let God's word be the standard, not what's culturally acceptable be the standard. Well, 
We'll leave that there. I think everybody understands that section. So let's move on to other things. Verse 19, you shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanness. In my notes, verse 19, I have no comment. Verse 20, I literally put that in my notes. No comment. Verse 20, and you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife so to make yourself unclean with her. That's just basically reiterating um, the seventh commandment, Exodus chapter 20, not to commit adultery, and there's a defiling that happens. I just want to say this, you know, um, about committing adultery. Later on, you know, Jesus basically says that adultery is one of the very few things that is acceptable as grounds for a divorce. And that, to me, speaks of the heaviness of what adultery does to a marriage. It takes a knife to the marriage, slaughters it, kills the trust. And I think God just understands that that's just so difficult to rebound from that he allows there to be a divorce in that circumstance. But can I say this? I don't think it's God's heart that even when there's adultery, that there needs to be divorce. He understands. He makes an allowance for that. But I've seen people who, in their marriage, there's been Christian couples where adultery has happened, and it's horrible, and it wrecks marriages. But I've seen them both. I've seen there be real true repentance on one end, real true forgiveness, and God do miraculous healings and make marriages even stronger sometimes. Isn't our God gracious? And I can't imagine how difficult that is for some of you sitting in this room where you've been the victim of that or you've been the perpetrator of that. But there is forgiveness from the Lord. Amen. This is not the unforgivable sin, nor is divorce the unforgivable sin. God is gracious. But it just speaks to the seriousness of the fall. You know, some sins have, a, have a more of a fallout than other sins. And this is one that hurts, breaks families. And, but God is gracious, and, and he's able to redeem even that. Now, this is super interesting to me. Verse 21 kind of sneaks up on you. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech and so profane the name of the Lord, God, your God. I am the Lord. This is fascinating to me. It seems, though, out of nowhere, he says, oh, and by the way, you're not to give your children to Molech. Now, who was Molech? Molech was one of the Canaanite gods that they hadn't encountered yet that they're about to encounter in Canaan. And one of their practices to, of worshiping Molech was you would take your infant child and you would offer them onto the arms of Molech. And what they would do is like have these metal idols, like an empty belly where they would put a fire in this metal and the arms would be out like this. And you would literally lay a, a baby on the incandescent hot Arms. I'm not trying to be gross. It's, it's, it's disgusting. Why would anybody do that? In fact, by the way, if you've ever heard of the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna um, in Israel, the south corner of Jerusalem, there's this deep valley called the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna or Tophet, it's called in the Bible. And as the history of Israel plays out, what do we see happen? At least two of their kings, Manasseh and I forget the other one, Ahaz, I think, both were guilty. The kings of sacrificing their own children in the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna. If you go to Israel now, it's like this beautiful, like, grassy knoll park. And, and there's times when we've done tours over there where you just sit in this park and you're looking at that Valley of Hinnom. And in your mind, you just say, how could it be that years ago they were offering children? It became the trash dump eventually of the place. But just a horrific thing. Israel did get caught up into that worship from time to time in their history. Um, Here's what's fascinating. I was thinking about this. Why did God throw that in right here? This whole chapter has to do with sex. Why did God throw Molech worship right in between like adultery and other sexual things? Because the reality is, is that the worship of Molech had a lot to do with infanticide. And it's where they would get rid of unwanted babies, inconvenient babies, or illegitimately born babies. And you don't have, this is a touchy subject, but you don't have to stretch that too far to understand 
where we're at as a culture. Where babies are cut short, they're, they're killed, they're murdered inside the womb and even outside the womb at times. Because it's not convenient, because it's this, because... And my heart goes out. I, I'm, this is, there's no judgmental voice in, in my voice and certainly not the Lord's voice in this topic, but our culture has become so numb to this. And we've bought in to this idea that it's a political issue or a, a, a my rights issue. It certainly is not. It is not. It's a moral issue. And we have to stay very strong on this point, especially as voting's coming up. You need to understand, we need to, I, do, I don't get political on a lot of things. You probably notice that about me. I don't, but I think it is important. You better know where your candidate stands on issues like this because this is huge. I want to say this too because statistically, it's very possible that there's women in here that have had abortions. And you need to understand something. It's a sin and it's wrong, but you need to understand something. That sin is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's no need to continue on with feeling shamed or guilt or condemned over that sin. You are forgiven. If you have brought it to the Lord, he can heal you internally in your heart and your mind. You are free. You don't need to drag that around with you. And there's coming a day you will be reunited with that little one. I really believe that. I think there's a scriptural case for that. And so this is not to condemn anyone, but I believe there's a very real reason why God threw Molech worship right into a chapter dealing with sex because that was happening then and it's in a different form, but it's happening now. And it's just, again, like that, that river analogy when it's, it's just destruction. Well, let's move on. He says in verse uh, 22, it just goes to a, a little bit lighter of a topic now. You shall not lie with males as with a woman. It is abomination. <laughs> that was a little bit of a trying to be facetious on that. Uh, this is not a light subject either. God is just basically saying very clearly in his word that homosexual sex is prohibited. Um, of course, in the New Testament, we have that clearly spelled out as well in Romans chapter 1. I will take the time to go there because it's such a hot topic and a, and a huge thing. Uh, verses 26 and 27, Romans 1, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Please, I know you probably know this, this audience, but it, it, it needs to be said that God's view of homosexuality is that it is a sin, that it is wrong. He calls it an abomination, and we like to say it's abomination. We like to say it with some spit when we say that. A lot of other sins are called abominations too, but this is clearly a sin. And again, you know, our culture in its mad craziness of, of not only wanting you know, pushing that homosexuality is accepted. I mean, that was kind of where I was 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, seeing that, oh, our culture's really wanting to just let homosexuality be accepted. But no, it's way beyond that. It's like encouraged, celebrated, um, and it's turned into even a civil rights issue. And again, may I say this again, we can't allow the culture to dictate what the Bible says is, is right and wrong. It's not a civil rights issue. It's a moral issue. And I think, though, having said that, if we're being honest, that we have done poorly as a church, not Calvary Chapel North Shore per se, but as the church as a whole in the West, I think we have done a poor job of responding to that, maybe in an overreaction to that push from the world. We have come out kind of historically so hard against homosexuality that we've somehow put it in its own category of sin, whereas the reality is, is that it's not a worse sin than heterosexual sin. And because of that, I think we've really marginalized and pigeonholed a lot of people that are truly struggling with that sin. There are a lot of Christians who have homosexual tendencies, and they struggle with where their identity is. 
And I don't know how helpful it is for us to say, just on a hard line, you got, of course we call it a sin. Of course we call it, 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 say what it is. But may our heart be that of winning a brother, winning a sister to repentance and to life. Amen? I do not believe a person is born necessarily that way. There's no genetic confirmation of that. Having said that, I, I have no problem believing that people do have maybe the, from the earliest ages tendencies that way. Why? Because we're broken, sinful people. Guess what? There's other people that have a strong urge to kill people. And there's other people that want to have sex with everything that walks along the road. What do you do with those? You confess it, you repent from it, and you ask God to give you grace to abstain from those things. And there's a lot of good Christian men and women who have to live lives of, of celibacy and abstinence because they just aren't maybe attracted to the opposite sex. They are struggling with that homosexual tendency, and we need to encourage them to keep their eyes on Christ and treat it like any other area of sinful life where we just confess it, we're real with it before God, we pray for his grace. If there's a slip up, we confess it, we move on, but we, we, we just treat it, I guess, the same way we treat every other sin. Amen? Does that make sense? And I think sometimes we've done, those who are truly struggling with uh, that particular sin, a, a little bit of a disservice where I want us to be a little more gracious, not condoning, not, you understand what I'm saying? But just realizing there are people that need grace. You know, I've had a lot of conversations with men and women who have struggled in that area and whatnot. And you know, One of the biggest lies is, I remember talking to a young girl at my church, grew up in a church in Oregon, and when she was in her late teens, she came, she was like, I'm, I'm gay. I was like, okay, let's talk about it. We were praying and da 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 but her whole line was, this is who I am. And if you don't, and I was like, no, it's not who you are. It's what you're doing. It's who I am. Look, I'm heterosexual, but I don't say, this is who I am. I'm a Christian. There's a lot more to me than, you know what I'm saying? But the lie of the world is, this is who you are, and you have to be you. Da, da, da. And I know what I'm saying is very unpopular. Probably in some cities, probably going to be arrested at this point. The reality is, is God just very simply says homosexuality is not okay. Remember what I said at the beginning? Incest, we're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> bingo, of course, God. Homosexuality, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. we dance around it. And we just need to not allow culture to dictate what God says is true and not true. Amen? Maybe I rambled a little bit there, but it's, it's honestly a topic that's close to my heart. My uncle lived a homosexual life his entire life. And was so militant that if we sent him a Christmas card with a verse on it, he would rip it up, put it in another envelope, and mail it back to us. He didn't want to hear about God. He didn't want to hear about changing. He didn't want to hear about anything. And then he got AIDS. And God was reaching out to him. I remember at a, at a, he came and visited us when he was very sick with AIDS. And he was so angry because we went, he, he came to church, and I was like, I'm 17, and I'm just like, God, just touch my uncle. Lord, touch him, heal him. And the pastor gave the sermon, but the, the, the original pastor was that pastor's dad, and he got up one, on that Sunday after the service, and he had the, the gift of the um, word of knowledge. And he said, God's telling me right now there's somebody in, his, in this room that has a disease that their, their doctors are saying is incurable, and God wants to heal you right now. And I'm weeping. And I'm like, go up there, uncle. Go up there, uncle. He didn't go up there. Instead, he just was so angry on their way home that we had told the pastor that he had AIDS. We didn't tell the pastor anything. The Holy Spirit did. And it was so sad. But on his deathbed, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he shared Christ with every nurse that came by. And he renounced all of it. And he gave his entire life to Jesus. And he passed away in 1993. And so... I don't know. Yeah, amen. Let's applaud the Lord on that. Amen. So praise God. I don't know why. Yeah, let's just move on. There's a little more ground to cover. Well, then he says in verse 23, and you shall not lie with any animal and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Yes, you read that right. And guys, I, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but I was been on some missions trips in the last seven or eight years where, where I was out. I'm not even going to mention what country it was. 
this was a very real thing that was happening and a problem within the villages and the culture that we were at. All that to say is that God puts this up in the word for a reason because we're capable of crazy things. And by God's grace, we can be forgiven of those crazy things, but he's prohibiting those things, again, to nail the point. We don't allow what culture or society says to dictate what's right and wrong. We leave that to God's word. Quickly, let's end this chapter with the, this warning, and I'll just read through the whole thing. It's pretty self-explanatory. He says, don't make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all of these, the nations I'm driving out before you have become unclean, and the land has become unclean. So that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants. There's a word picture for you. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations, either, excuse me, either the uh, native or the stranger who sojourns among you. Because um, the people of the land who are before you did all of these abominations so that the land has become unclean, lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean as it vomited out the nations that it was before you. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the persons who do them shall be cut off among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs and, uh, that were practiced before you and never make yourself unclean by them. I am the Lord, your God. I love how he ends it with this, how he started. I'm the Lord. Why should I'm the Lord? Just don't do it. This is interesting because what he says is, look, don't do these things and the land you're going into, the Canaanites, did you hear what he said? Basically, they have been involved in all of these things and it has so permeated their culture and so messed up the land that God is actually using the children of Israel to go into the land and using them as an instrument of judgment. Did you guys catch that? To expel those people out of the land. He's like, look, they are so messed up with this. It has infected the whole, world, the whole area and so you guys are going to come in, dispossess them, take possession of the land. Then what does he say to them? But if you do it, just know this. You'll get vomited out too. Pretty stern warning. He's like, don't think you're above this. Don't think that, you, that I won't do the same thing. You know, I, I could go off on a whole bunch of stuff right now. I won't, but I'll just say this. You know, I, I feel like we're there as a, as, a, as a nation, aren't we? I'm not saying that the church is Israel or the America is Israel. I'm just saying if it's just a principle, we need God's grace in our country because we are there and beyond. Where we are is scary. And we are reaping what we've sown as a nation. We really are. And, you know, all the statistics and pornography and sex trade and all of it's crazy. But I do believe God's going to judge the nation too. But I think real judgment, as the Bible says, has to start in the house of the Lord. And I think that we need to start with us. You know, it's easy to point fingers at them over there in the world, but we need, I think, to just kind of look inward a little bit in a good way and take inventory of these things. You know, my daughter's visiting. She's still um, in jail, quarantine. Um, but... She asked me tonight as, as I was getting ready to eat, she's, she, she's seen me prepare for a lot of sermons, and she goes, so, Dad, what's your main point? You always have, like, a main point. What is it for tonight? And I was like, I, I don't know if I've landed on it completely yet, but I, I, I kind of had something rolling around. I want you quickly, if we have, like, three or four more minutes, turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There's kind of a New Testament side to this. Real quick, we're not going to take a lot of time on this. 1 Thessalonians 4, I think you'll see some parallels here. He says this, Finally, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk, that is to live, and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. I love this. He says, look, guys, he's at the end of his letter, you've heard what we said, how, how you should live Walk is like a metaphor for the way you live. We've taught you how to walk, and, and, and you're doing it. You're doing a good job, and we're just hoping you'll, you'll go more and more. And I like that because we could say that at our church. Hey, you're walking with God, and there's things in your life you've changed, and you're learning to walk with the Lord. You're doing a good job. Let's go more and more. Let's, let's go further. And then he says, for you know that 
uh, what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. This is the will of God. You ever wondered what the will of God is in your life? This is the will of God for you, hands down, with certainty. Your sanctification, holy living, that you abstain from sexual immorality, which is a phrase, sexual immorality that includes not only adultery, it includes premarital sex, it includes homosexuality, it includes pornography, it includes just the whole gamut. That each one of you should know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God, that no one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger of these things as we told you before and solemnly warned you, God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So I wanted to end like this, because I would imagine that there's certain attitudes in this room right now. And I would imagine that the greatest attitude is, is maybe one of, of, you know, I've maybe failed in this area in some way sexually, lived in an unholy way. Even as a Christian, you might say. And I want to encourage you that you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Amen? And, and that, you know what? You can just move on in victory. And there might be others here where you're, you're genuinely, listen to me, you're genuinely, listen to me, you're genuinely struggling. You're struggling. What I mean by struggling is, is you're not just going for it with no regard to what God thinks. You really are trying to walk with the Lord and do what's right but there's an area in the sexual realm of some kind, and you're just struggling with that. And I want to tell you this tonight. It's God's will that you, sanctify, that, you're, that you live in holiness. Now, when I say that, I'm not trying to heap on you like, I know it's God's will, just get off me. What I'm saying is this, it's God's will. That means he's going to help you. That means he's going to give you the grace. He's not going to say, it's my will, but I'm not going to give you the grace to actually do it. Get it together, come on. Listen, it's his will that you're sanctified. So if you're struggling, man, come to him and tell him you're struggling. And if you fail, receive that forgiveness and move on. And I want to tell you this, man, you can have victory over pornography and you can have victory over these things. It's a lie from Satan to say that you can't. You know what? It happens like this. You confess, you repent, and then the Bible says, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, I know that's a whole other sermon we could go on, but we're not going to. But the point is, don't just try to get rid of the bad stuff. Just start focusing on the good stuff. Focus on who God is. Spend so much time with Jesus, you forget to sin. Make Him your passion. All that to say is, maybe you're here and you're like, oh, I failed, forgiven. Maybe you're here and you're like, oh, I'm struggling. He's with you and He wants to help you. But maybe you're here and you're saying, whatever. I'll do what I want. He addresses that too, just like Leviticus did. Stern warning. Hey, don't get in there and just think you can do it and there's no repercussions. Notice what he, Paul says in the New Testament to Christians. Whoever disregards this does not disregard man, but disregards God. The word disregard means to contend with. If you don't like this and you say, I'm not going to do it, I'll do whatever I want. Okay, just know this. You're not contending against some man's opinion. You're fighting against God. And that's heavy. And let me just say this a little bit more on the serious side. If there is someone in here tonight where your attitude is, I don't care what the Bible says, and I don't care what you say, Pastor, and I don't care what anybody says. It's my body, and it's my life, and I'm going to live how I want. Cool, but don't call yourself a Christian. Because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you do care what God thinks. I'm not saying we don't, we don't all have areas and times of struggle. Again, you know that. But don't think that you can just live how you want, thumb your nose at God, give him the finger, and live how you want, and there not be consequences. And you're going to feel them because you're nothing special. <laughs> you don't hear that every day. Every day you hear, you're special. I'm telling you, look, you're nothing special. God, and I mean this by that. God's no respecter of persons. So I don't care if you're the pastor or whoever you are, if you thumb your nose at God and purposely, willingly, knowingly live in disobedience, that is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. And God even says in Galatians, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Those are the, that's what the Bible says. It's not what Jason says. So, again, I don't know where you fall on that spectrum. Ah, oh, I forgive it. Or, I messed up. Ah, oh, forgive it. I'm struggling right now. He's with you. I don't really give a crap. I don't know if you can say that from the pulpit. Um, <laughs> you need to repent. But either way, man, praise God for his truth. Amen? And praise God that no matter how we failed in the past, there's grace for every mistake we've made. Even if it was 10 you know, minutes before church started, there's grace. Amen? But listen, God wants you to live in a way where you know how to possess your body, that you live in sanctification. Why? Because he wants to restrict you and have no fun in life. No! He wants you to experience life the way it was meant to be. He wants to give you life in that abundantly. Amen. And that's found in obedience to Christ. Let's pray.